The date is January 8, 1959. The Cuban people celebrate as Fidel Castro and only a few hundred rebels have finally overthrown the corrupt Batista government and its army of 10,000 troops. Castro's remarkable charismatic leadership and the sophisticated guerrilla tactics the rebels deployed led to their victory. Behind Castro, the rebels accomplished something that nobody else had done in 400 years, winning Cuba's independence from foreign domination. But since so much of what happened depended on the unique personality of Fidel, it is crucial to understand who was Fidel Castro and what shaped his life. The story begins on August 13, 1926 in Baran, Cuba, when Fidel Castro was born. His father, Angel Castro, was a wealthy landowner, and his mother was a maid who had an affair with Angel and birthed Castro while Angel's wife was away. When his wife returned, Angel sent Fidel and two of his siblings away to avoid a scandal, making Fidel an illegitimate child, known as Fidel Castro Ruz, and giving him a rough start to his life. Fidel was sent to live in Santiago de Cuba, and later to Havana for high school where he eventually attended a prestigious Jesuit boarding school, meant to correct his rebellious behavior. When he turned 18 and graduated, Angel finally let him use his last name, officially making him Fidel Castro. Fidel then attended the University of Havana, where he became very active in left-wing causes, including participation in violent protests at Bogota, Colombia. In 1948, Castro returned to Cuba and married Myrta diaz Balart, coincidentally a member of the extended Batista family. In September 1950, Castro graduated from law school, and in 1952, he ran for Cuba's House of Representatives as part of the mainstream Orthodox Party. But Batista seized power in a military coup and canceled the elections, which did not sit well with Castro. He at first opposed the government through lawsuits, but when nothing came of them, he started to build up a force of 1,200 anti-Batista recruits. He was ready to start a revolution. From the outset, let me say, I never met Castro, but I did have the opportunity to see Castro. It happened in Quito, Ecuador. I happened to be in the park, so walking in the park, I look up and I see two figures in military dress. I quickly identify one as Fidel Castro. I identified his companion as Ortega, who was president of Nicaragua at that time. I was impressed with Castro because of his physical dominance as compared to Ortega. Ortega may have been 5'2", and Castro was over six feet, so there was a dramatic difference. Having heard Castro speak in Spanish, I was aware of his ability to talk and talk and talk. Diciendo que los campesinos no la querían Íbamos a reunir medio millón de campesinos con sus machetes. So my impression of Castro at that time, and it lingered with me, was that Castro was not only dominant physical figure in Cuban history, but also verbally gigantic and is able to convince people to follow him. After Batista's coup, Castro gathered forces and planned a military assault that would take place in July 1953. Castro targeted the Cuban military barracks called Moncada near Santiago de Cuba. Their goal was to steal the large supply of weapons at the barracks and use the weapons to mount a larger attack on Batista. But the assault was a complete failure and most of the 82 men were killed or captured. Castro, too, was captured and sentenced to 15 years in prison. Though the attack failed, the 26th of July would become a sacred day in Cuban history, representing the start of the revolution. At his trial, Castro famously declared, History will absolve me. Less than two years later, Batista bowed to public pressure and released Castro, along with the other prisoners. 
Castro tried to remain active politically, but was closely watched by Batista. So he left for Mexico to prepare his next move. Batista turned the entire country against him. That was true in the cities where anyone suspected of opposition sympathy was kidnapped and very often murdered. Uh, and in the countryside, where whole villages were sometimes either massacred or displaced. Batista had become a puppet of the powerful in Cuba and the U.S. In December 1956, Castro was ready to attack Batista from Mexico by sea. But he didn't know Batista had people reporting on Castro's plans from Mexico, so Batista knew where and when the attack was coming. Castro and about 80 rebels crowded onto a yacht called the Grandma, meant to hold only 25. After a rugged seven-day trip, they landed on the southwest tip of Cuba on December 2nd, 1956, but were soon attacked by Batista's forces. Only 19 rebels escaped with their lives, and then they fled to the Sierra Maestra Mountains. In the mountains, Fidel, Raul, and Che Guevara, whom they met in Mexico, began to build up their rebel forces and train them in guerrilla warfare. There were three key components to the rebels' growing success, Propaganda, intelligence, and ambush. He manipulated Western journalists and even Batista into thinking he had an army of thousands, when it was really less than 200. A New York Times reporter visited Castro in the mountains, and Castro arranged for his lieutenants to constantly interrupt him with information about the troop movements to make the reporter think his army was much bigger and more active than it really was. So we have this extraordinary thing that Fidel, the 20 man, is on the front page of the New York Times as the face of the Cuban uh, resistance. That so inspires people that to CBS News decides to go up there as well. And here we have a guy named Robert Tabor who uh, decides to interview Fidel. And Fidel, has, he's a nat TV natural, it turns out. And he Commander Castro, why are you leading a revolution? I am leading a revolution because the legal government of my country was overthrown by the army led by Batista. 80 second days before a general election in which the people of Cuba was going to elect its own government. And instead of that, General Batista established a bloodly tyranny. For finishing that tyranny, and for re-establishing a legal government in my country, we are fighting now. Fidel slept with his rifle in a hammock, and this was his headquarter. And I asked him, what do you want to do with this army of scoundrels? He replied, the important thing is not for my army to be powerful, but it is for the people to believe it. The rebels were able to win support from local peasants who provided them with details about the location and size of Batista's forces, making it easier to attack them. The rebels' intelligence proved most crucial in the summer of 1958, where they were alerted about a major attack called the Ofensiva. The people in the area supported the revolutionaries and, through a series of runners, kept the revolutionary forces apprised of where Batista's troops were at every moment. And so the revolutionaries were able to attack individual units of Batista's army and defeat them one after another and win that battle even though they were outnumbered 10 to 1. That signaled to the army that this war was probably going to be lost. And from that moment on, the performance of the army began to deteriorate, uh, morale fell, desertions increased, and the rebels moved down out of the mountains and began to advance on the cities of the island. Castro and his men were finally able to move into the cities, which was a critical turning point. By December 1958, the revolutionary forces were taking city after city before finally entering Havana. Batista fled with hundreds of millions of dollars into exile in the Dominican Republic, and then Castro went on a 1,000-kilometer march from Santiago to Cuba, entering Havana in triumph on January 8th. He is greeted by jubilant crowds as the liberator of Cuba. Castro was able to overthrow the Batista dictatorship, and his communist government has ruled Cuba until this very day. But what is the legacy of Castro's revolution? Castro is a charismatic leader. Without any question, the Cuban people would have followed him into anything. 
even people who might wish that he would retire, still have a grudging respect for Castro. He put Cuba on the map. I think most Americans misjudge him. He's extremely bright, his IQ is high. He's very, very well read. He's done a tremendous amount for that country that we don't credit him with. The infant mortality rate in Castro's Cuba is lower than in the capital of the richest country in the world, Washington, D.C. Similarly on, on education, literacy. For its income level, uh, Cuba's ahead of most of the world in terms of literacy. But he's an ideologue and he has used very poor judgment in his management of the economy. Uh, it's true that he faces a great penalty today because we apply economic sanctions again. We're the only country in the world that applies uh, economic sanctions against Cuba. It is a penalty, but he could overcome it to a far greater degree he has if he had introduced uh, more, I'm going to call it, market principles into his economy. He's made a great mistake on that. No assessment of Castro and his revolution would be complete without considering the geopolitical impact on the region. As one of the world's leading communist countries, Cuba was an inspiration for other countries that wanted to pursue a socialist path. And soon after the revolution, Cuba turned to Russia for protection and economic support. This relationship brought the world to the brink of nuclear war and annihilation with the Cuban Missile Crisis. We now know that the Soviet Union, not content with Dr. Castro's oath of fealty, not content with the destruction of Cuban independence, not content with the extension of Soviet power into the Western Hemisphere, not content with a challenge to the inter-American system and to the United Nations Charter, has decided to transform Cuba into a base for communist aggression, into a base for putting all of the Americas under the nuclear gun, and thereby to intensify the Soviet diplomacy of blackmail in every part of the world. The United States answer to what Adlai Stevenson termed Soviet blackmail in Cuba was a quarantine of all offensive weapons being shipped from Russia to that island fortress. The U.S. threw up a steel fence prepared to stop any vessel carrying materials of war. By embracing the Soviet Union, Fidel Castro had isolated Cuba. Despite his anger with Nikita Khrushchev over the Soviet leader's handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Fidel Castro realized by early 1963 that he had few options. The Soviets were helping the Cuban economy by providing the Cubans with oil. The Soviets were helping him build up an industrial base. And finally, the Soviets were making noises as if they were prepared to defend Cuba in the event that the United States ever broke John F. Kennedy's guarantee, non-invasion pledge. Many of the fears he had had about American dependence were now coming true in his relationship with the Soviet Union. So Castro succeeded in overthrowing Batista, and he did much to improve the lives of the Cuban people. But he also never gave the Cuban people a true democracy, and his decisions led to international isolation for the island nation. Many people who witnessed this history consider the results of Castro's revolution to be a mixed bag. What was the public's view, or the people that you ever talked about Castro with? What, what were other people's views of Castro? Their view was he betrayed what they all wanted and agreed to was the liberation of Cuba and the ousting of the Bautista dictatorship. And after they achieved his objective. The first objective is, I'm going to overthrow the government, and two, I'm going to remake Cuba the way I want to make it. Here was a man who had an idea. I'm going to liberate my country. I'm going to replace what you have with something new.